repeating the question that Meaty reads and what makes great art, what it's really addressing is how is and um, how should we assess or judge art? Right, now, uh, in the days when I taught art history in Portsmouth University, um, quite often this question would come up with my colleagues and they would tell me that I'm not interested in this question about great art or what's better art than other art and so on. They would say rather disdainfully. Uh, and then we would come to marking the students' work at the end of the year and they would get into vigorous arguments about whether the the uh, fine art student's work was worth 57 or 56, <laughs> or 62 or 63, and, and so on. Um, my, the point of my uh, irony about that is that actually, whether we want to or not, the fact is that societies have to make some judgment on this question, and so do most individuals, whether they recognize it as it wrong. Societies have to, because some decision has to be made about what goes in the galleries. Okay, you abolish the galleries, what goes on the street walls, uh, um, what is preserved, what isn't preserved. Uh, every week, month, year, people produce thousands of paintings, sculptures, whatever, uh, and, and so on, most of which, tragically, we might say, but, tra but it is the case, end up in the bin or not preserved. A small fraction of that gets preserved. Some of it gets preserved and becomes famous and so on. And there are social processes that make those decisions. If you're writing a book about art, what pictures do you put in your book and so on. It all goes on. And we we'll all hear the phrase... You know, I don't know much about whatever it, art, whatever it is, but I know what I like, meaning I just, make my, I just have my personal opinion. Well, actually, I'm afraid, like with fashion, you know, I just dress to please myself. I'm completely uninfluenced by anybody else, the adverts, the... the no, no, no. These are social processes, right? Just like if you were to consider the range of clothes that human beings could wear and you looked at yourselves here... Uh, we all have our individual variations, but almost everybody is within the tiny small <laughs> spectrum of what... There is nobody in a tuxedo. <laughs> there is nobody in a toga. <laughs> you know, so maybe. But generally speaking, we, we, we are pro our decisions are products of social process. And I'm going to look, start with, on the question of art, some of the ways in which these judgments have been made uh, historically and are made now, and then I'm going to ask what I think Marxism can add to, to, to that. So that's the, that's the idea be, behind the talk. And um, Right, some historic criteria. Now, this is not comprehensive. Uh, if I were to do this properly, you would have a much longer list, and I would go through it chronologically and how... Um, you know, at different judgments were made at different points in time in, in, in history, and how it changed and so on. Uh, and ten hours later, <laughs> I'd be the only person standing here, and you'd have all gone to the bar, uh, and so on. So it's a very concentrated picture of this. But these are some of the main criteria that have been used by people in basically the history of Western art, by the way. Oh, I should say in this that fairly unavoidably this is Eurocentric, mainly, not exclusively, but mainly. And secondly, it's all going to be about visual art, but I think that some of the ultimate conclusions apply to things like um, music, poetry, drama, literature, and so on. I'll, you know, I'll leave that, that can come up, uh, and so on. I'm going to show, I'm going to argue it in relation to visual art, but some of the main conclusions, I think, do transfer. Okay, some historic criteria. The first, Mimesis, Greek word, came from Plato and used by Plato and Aristotle and so on, had its own complexities, but it meant mimesis, imitation, imitation of nature. And by nature, it meant the world outside human beings and so on. It, it, the ability to imitate the appearances of things. Uh, often, the word used for this is naturalism, or, and sometimes we think of this as mixed with techno technical skill. Uh, 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 and so on. So the first thing, and you hear it all the time in the way people still talk about art, uh, you know, did it look like it? Oh, you could, you could, you could touch that velvet, you could almost I imagine that you could drink that glass of wine, or it looked perfect, you could feel you with it, and so on. That is about the ability of the artist to imitate nature and make it uh, feel uh, real. First criteria, still with us today. Uh, beauty, harmonious form. 
This came to the fore particularly uh, in the time of the Renaissance. So it was the, the idea that the job of the artist was to arrange beautiful forms, to present you with something beautiful. There was a variation of this, the concept of the sublime, because they were aware that, well, you couldn't only just paint beautiful, lovely things. They thought Madonnas were beautiful and so on. But then you had the sublime often referred to things that may be awesome or even terrifying and so on. There's a variation on that. So it was considered a merit of art that it should invoke these feelings of all, particularly, again, in relation to nature, but not only in uh, another criteria was expression or emotional power. So, the task of the artist is to express feelings, to express states uh, uh, of feeling. And good art expresses those states of feeling very powerfully or very accurately or very well in one form or another. This, I, going back then to the days when I used to teach art history among students, if I'd asked, what it, why are you into art? What it, they would say, I want to express myself. That was a common answer, and it still is a common motivation behind people making up this idea to express your feelings, and, uh, although it's not always personal. Realism. This is beloved of much uh, socialist uh, view, view of art, that art should be realistic or give you a realistic picture. It's not the same as the first one, by the way. Realism here <laughs> meant something broader than just uh, imitation. Realism here usually has two meanings, social and psychological. You give some sort of picture of real, the, the, how the society really is, how people live. Uh, all right, uh, uh, maybe a broad or wide picture, particularly in the novel. This applies usually particularly in the novel because it's well suited to it more than painting. But you, you give a realistic picture of how people live. Or sometimes it can be that you give a psychologically uh, insightful picture on how people uh, are feeling. More modern, really, broadly speaking, the criteria of innovation or originality. This develops particularly with so-called modernism. You know, the thing is to be doing something for the first time. So-and-so is the first artist to paint in this way, or to sculpt in that way, or to make work in that, uh, uh, in that way. Uh, it's original. Other, in other periods, by the way, artists were not trying to be original. They were trying to be traditional. <laughs> They were trying to attain what they thought was a standard of perfection that had been achieved before them, and so on, rather than to do it new and do it uh, original. But originality, innovation became a particular um, uh, uh, value. And last of all, critique, which is a very uh, influential idea at the moment, that art should be presenting a critique of other art, artistic critique, or a social political critique should be making socially pol and political criticisms of the society. Now I'm going to go through and show kind of some examples for all these, th these different, various different things. Okay. An example of, if you like, pure technique. Trump lawyer, it was pointed out to me quite right that Trump's lawyers spelt the I as the other wrong way around, but never mind. <laughs> the, uh, this is uh, from uh, uh, a thing that was particularly in vogue in the, uh, the Dutch Republic and the Dutch Golden Age. But the point is here that if you see this, not when you sit like that, but if you see it, if you look at across the room at something like that, you almost think it's really there. It's so well done. You might also think it's a bit pointless. You know, but it's pure idea. I chose it to isolate this question of mimesis, imitation, technical skill in doing. Very difficult to do, but limit, li perhaps limited. The same thing on a much higher level. Hans Holbein's The Ambassadors. Now, here you want to talk about really being able to feel it, that ability to render all the different textures and so on. I mean, actually, if you go close-ups on the book here, you can, you know, there's, uh, you can, there's music and so on, you can see what it is and you can read the text. These are fantastic surfaces and plots and so on, and there's a glow, and if you go in detail, you can see the maps and so on. It's an extraordinary technical achievement to produce that, and I, but I shall revisit this later. Ah, uh, uh, second time around. Uh, we come back to this and I'll talk about that the second time around. Okay, what that is down there. Good. Good. It's a skull from a funny angle, but... Right, harmonious form. 
All right, classic examples. Botticelli's Primavera um, uh, from Florence in, in the Renaissance, the star painting in the, uh, uh, in, in the uh, uh, name of it has gone, the, the gallery in, what's it called? The Uffizi, thank you, Mary. In the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. Uh, or this one, Raphael, the Sistine and Madonna. Uh, a beautifully balanced uh, arrangement. Now, the, when harmonious form was considered the prime value, it, I, I think it would probably be true to say that Raphael was considered the greatest of artists, you know, because, because he was considered the master of this and these kind of perfectly balanced and formed uh, Madonnas and so on that, that, uh, that, that he, he produced. Uh, the sublime, the sublime particularly, or in the face of nature, here we have Turner, an avalanche in the Grison's mountains. You know, it is the, this invocation of perhaps awe, terror, and the, the great forces of love. Different kind of version of the sublime might be found in Michelangelo's The Last Judgment. Here, it would be the awesomeness of the power of Christ, you know, casting the sinners down into hell and raising uh, the virtuous up into heaven. Okay, so... Um, expression, emotional power. Uh, probably the beginning on the most important of artists who could be said to have developed expressionism was Van Gogh. Um, the Starry Night, right? Using a natural scene, the night sky and the cypress trees and so on, and investing them with immense expressive and emotional power. A yeah, different, different form of the same thing here. Kathy Colwitz, Woman with Dead Child in 1903. Uh, very, very powerful emotional statement about poverty. Uh, Kathy Colwitz was a social democrat at the time. She was the wife of a doctor and so on. She who was working with the poor. She experienced the sufferings of the poor and she expresses it here. And this is a, a, a woman with her dead child. Very, very uh, powerfully. Uh, um, uh, expressed. You will be aware as I go through this that categories overlap. A huge amount of technical skill in that uh, as well, but I'll come back to that uh, uh, in a moment. But I'm just illustrating, as it were, the values that uh, could be evoked to say why is that a good piece of art or a great piece of art, depending on what, what you thought, but uh, uh, mainly I would think because of its emotional power. Social realism. Uh, I want to show you a couple of examples of a great realist artist from the uh, eight, from uh, the eighteenth century, William Hogarth. Arake's progress. All right, he did a series of etchings and paintings depicting life of the times. Uh, in 18th century England, and in particular, he did the rake's progress, uh, the rake, uh, 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 a young bourgeois who gets into drinking, gambling, women, and so on, and then finds himself in debt, and gradually goes through a series of catastrophes and declines till he, uh, declined till he ends up here uh, in Bedlam. Bedlam being the uh, mental hospital, the asylum, which at that time you were held naked and in chains, and uh, you were also became an object of um, entertainment or amusement for society people who would come round and, you know, like in the zoo, they would go and look at the, uh, the, the, the mad people who were chained up and so on. Such was Bedlam in the, the 18th century. Uh, you know, the expression is still with us. So, uh, Hogarth did this and many other pictures of social uh, uh, reality in, in, his, in his day. All right. This I give you uh, Velasquez, Pope Innocent X from 1650 as uh, really an example of psychological realism. 
It's obviously also, you look at it, the extraordinary uh, mimetic technical skill involved and great composition and so on as well. But what's really striking about it, I think, is the psychological realism in, in this painting. Fantastic depiction of um, shrewdness, of uh, what it meant to be a pope, what it meant to be actually a secular power. He doesn't come across the particularly, the title is amusing in a way, Pope Innocent X. Uh, I wouldn't be bank on this man's innocence. Um, uh, and I wouldn't, you wouldn't want to cross him, would you? Uh, you know, that's, it's a brilliant de depiction of a shrewd man of power in the world. Different form of um, psychological realism here. Frida Kahlo, Broken Column. Right. Uh, obviously, it's not naturalistic, right? but it depicts what it feels like. It's obviously also, by the way, emotional power and expression, but what it's doing is it gives a psychologically realistic picture of it, or what it felt like to have this injury that Frida Kahlo uh, lived with. That was an accident early in her life. And how her body felt. Look at the, the, the pins or the nails in the body and the broken column and the uh, um, kind of uh, frame that she had to wear, etc. And the, uh, the tears from her eyes and so on. So it's a, it's pa it's a painting which ex expresses, gives you tremendous psychological realism, but not naturalism. Okay. Originality. Now, uh, this painting, Picasso's Les Demoiselles d'Avignon of 1907, occupies an iconic position in the history of modern art because it was the first, it was a breakthrough painting that did a number of things that had not been done before. Right? It, it is, opens the way to the whole break from naturalism in modern art. It opens the way to the development of cubism. It is a dramatic step in collapsing the space in the picture, in moving the background forward so it becomes flat and in your face. It involves, it, it involves the appropriation of African masks for, for, for various reasons. It, it's, I, you could do a whole meeting I think I did once, on this painting, and why it was such a dramatic step forward. But now, if you were to go to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, where this is, it has pride of place because it is seen as the painting that in some way or other inaugurated or opened up 20, 20th century art. So it's its originality that is particularly uh, important in it. But other works can be valued, particularly for their originality. Um, Uccello's Battle of San Romano, which you can see in the uh, uh, National Gallery here, uh, is particularly important, not only because it's a very interesting arrangement of colours and shapes and so on, which it is, but also because it was pioneering the use of perspective. It was developing perspective in a way that made Uccello very important and original in terms of the, the history of art. Notice here that you get, it's certainly not certain things that it's not doing. Right? It's not a realistic depiction of war. That, that is for sure. Uh, you look at your lead man on his horse, on the white horse here in his hat. I don't really believe anybody went into war wearing a hat like that. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, the, the, uh, the horses really look more like horses on a carousel than they do in battle. Okay? So it doesn't score high, as it were, on that. But it is an interesting composition. But the main point is that it is exploring perspective in all sorts of ways. Look at all those l broken lances that are arranged on the kind of field of battle and so on, et cetera. Uh, or this guy down here, dead, who's too small. But he's, he's uh, the, the, the man who died for perspective because he was <laughs> put there to work out, you know, where the feet are and the head and how, how to do it and, and so on. Yeah, so it was this, uh, the, this, this quality. Now, critique. Um, as I was coming in, the comrade asked me, am I going to do something about Marcel Duchamp? Well, here he is. Um, now, uh, here we have the Mona Lisa with moustache. Uh, and 
L H O O Q at the at the bottom, um, which uh, actually, if you say apparently, it means she has a hot ass. Um, <laughs> might get you into trouble these days, but saying something like that. But uh, it was pre what was the point about this? It was a point of making. He was making a point about art and art. Uh, 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 and establishment art, ruling class art, bourgeois art, whatever you like to put it up to, the, uh, to this point in time. And around the time where, when this was done, a number of artists, they were rebelling, and they were rebelling against what they saw as ruling class culture, museum culture, and so it takes various forms. Malevich in Russia does a, just a black square, for, for, for example. They were kind of provocations. And Marcel Duchamp, who also did a urinal and so on, was an expert at this provocation, which raises questions about the nature of art. Of course, one reaction to this is to say, that's appalling. How can you call that a work of art when just he's done a graffiti on the greatest work of art of all time, uh, the Mona Lisa and so on? But the point about um, Marcel Duchamp is that he knew that people would react like that, and he was, kind of, he was also a chess player, he was kind of playing these moves. What response will people make if I do a moustache on the Mona Lisa. And he was setting up, as it were, a critical debate uh, in, in, uh, 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 over the issues, for which he has you know, been, come to be considered uh, an important fig figure in the history of art. But then you get something like this. This is, uh, I want to put this in a kind of social critique, and he, extraordinary painting. This is a painting of uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil. It's called Lilith the sort of goddess of the night, and is a devastating picture of, and this is a vast picture, by the way, it's a devastating picture of a polluted modern industrial city, and so on. So that's, that would be an example of social critique. By the way, all of these things that I'm going, the aesthetic critique, the social critique, you could give hundreds of examples, so I just had to choose ones I wanted to get a, a range of things. You could choose hundreds of examples of, of paintings that offered some kind of social critique. Okay, now using, if you go through the, these cri criteria that, I, that I've talked about, um, the mimesis, the, the technical skill in, in, in imitation, the harmonious form, the sublime, the expressive power, re, re, uh, emotional power, realism, social uh, and uh, um, psychological realism, originality, critique, and so on. Use, use all, think of all this. I think the way most people, most of the time, judge art now is a kind of mixture, an accumulation of all of those things, depending on what it strikes you. And I think if you read the average art critic, it's the same. From sometimes they'll say, this work was really stunning. The favorite phrase, it was really stunning. And you think, well, what does that mean? It's, you know, what, what does it actually, what's actually mean by saying it's stunning? I felt stunned by it, I liked it, etc. But then they, they would invoke that such and such a thing was extraordinarily skillful, such was original, uh, such uh, was very powerful, such, you, you know, it was very expressive and so on. It's a mixture of those things. And I think you can, you can do this, and I think it makes a kind, kind of sense uh, uh, to invoke these. And I want to say, show you the sort of judgments that I think you could make. All right. Um, people may or may not agree. Uh, so we'll see. That's one of the nice things. We can debate all these things. But I will show you this by David Hockney, Garrowby Hill from 1998. And I chose it cause, this one because it's slightly similar. If you look at this landscape, uh, right, receding into the horizon in the distance. And then compare it with that, which is Rubens Hetstein, which you can also see in the National Gallery. Right, again, a panoramic view of nature, landscape. Hetstein was his villa in, old, uh, in his old age, uh, and so on, going to the horizon in the past. Now, I don't know what you think, but I would say if you use some of the criteria that I've been talking about, this beats the Hockney by miles, is the first thing that, that, that I would say. And I, if you ask me, how would I say it? Why would I just justify it? Well, I think pretty much all the criteria we've talked about it wins. It's, there's more technical skill. There's more craft in the Rubens than there is in the Hockney. It's relatively crude, uh, what, what uh, Hockney has done. There is, I think, 
uh, more, so uh, there's more, um, I think, to my idea, it's more beautiful. It's a more, more beautiful form. There's certainly more, a greater sense of the sublime and the power of nature and so on and the greater sense of distance uh, in it. It also is more uh, expressive um, uh, uh, and more powerful, more realistic in a good sense in a, a strong sense and so on. Okay, I wouldn't claim for this social critique or anything like that, but in those terms you, you, could, you could make that comparison. You could also make a comparison with... Um, and I, to, I was comparing a modern painting, Hockney, with a painting 400 years ago. I compare now two relatively modern paintings, the Freud and, and, the, and the Hockney. Uh, I, I would want to argue that the Freud was a much better painting than the Hockney, that, and generally that Lucian Freud was a greater artist than David Hockney, um, on a number of the grounds that we've talked about, you know, more technical skill, uh, more uh, expressive, more realism in the best sense, uh, more uh, emotional power and so on. That's it. It's up to people. people. But what I'm trying to show here is that you can use all those criteria to make judgments, and we do. People are making those judgments all the time. What, now, the next thing I want to ask is what does Marxism add to this? I'm just looking at my time and realizing I'm behind time. It always happens. <laughs> right. What does Marxism add to this? I think Marxism can add something important to this. Right, let's look at two, two very basic statements, fundamentals. If anybody's ever investigated historical materialism that Marx makes about society and history, well, one is Marx, one is Engels. Right. It, it, in the social production of their existence, men inevitably enter into definite relations which are independent of their will, namely relations of production appropriate to a given stage in the development of their material forces of production. The totality of these relations of production constitutes the economic structure of society, the real foundation on which arises a legal and political superstructure and to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. The mode of production of material life conditions the general process of social, political, and intellectual life. In other words, the, the uh, process of production forms, as it were, the economic base of society, and on this arises an ideological superstructure, etc. Engels puts the same idea in slightly different form. He says that... Um, uh, Marx discovered the law of development of human history, the simple fact, hitherto concealed by an overgrowth of ideology, that mankind must first of all eat, drink, have shelter and clothing before it can pursue politics, science, art, religion, etc. And that therefore the production of the immediate material means and consequently the degree of economic development attained by a given people or during a given epoch form the foundation upon which the state institutions, the legal conceptions, art and even ideas on religion of the people concerned have been, involved, been, uh, 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 have been evolved. Okay, so you could put this very crudely, I wanted to put it in, uh, yeah, not going to make that, sorry, I tell you, not going to make it in five minutes, but I'll do my best. Uh, you could put it really simply and say, um, art reflects society, except just a couple of things here. It's not a passive reflection. Artists respond to society. They actively engage with it. So you're talking about an interaction, not just a passive uh, 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 reflection. And they do so in all sorts of different ways. Second qualification, when we're talking about the art and literature and music and so on as well, we're not just talking about relations of material production in the sense of uh, you know, factories or uh, mills or uh, and work bosses and workers or uh, landowners and serfs or peasants and so on. You're not just talking about those fundamental uh, economic relations in that sense. We're also talking, very importantly, about the web of social relations that are conditioned by those fundamental economic relations. In other words, we're talking about how people relate to their servants or their servants relate to their masters. How people look at their kings or their kings look at their people. Or we're talking about how people look at the sky. Because how people look at the sky and the land uh, and 
all these things and how people love and how they look at sex and how they relate to their children and so on. All these are social relations, right? And what I think you'll find, what I want to argue is that art, what's in, what makes great art, the answer to my question, as it, were, as it were, what makes great art is that it gives powerful expression to social relations between people, and in particular, changing social relations. Now, all the criteria that I've listed come into this, right? Your technical skill of the artist is part of it, <coughs> the form, the emotional power, the psychological realism, and so on. But what underpins it all is the question of the social relations that are being depicted, provided we don't think that just means paintings like Hogarth's. King Hogarth, but it doesn't just mean that, it comes in all sorts of different forms, and that I want to show quickly, this is why I'm not going to get there in the five minutes, but bear with me, kids. <laughs> okay, I said I'd come back to Holbein's Ambassadors. Right, I said this was an extraordinary piece of technical skill, but it does something else. Right? This was pointed out by uh, John Berger in Ways of Seeing, a crucial book on, on, on art. It also evokes <laughs> it also evokes an enormous change in economic and social relations that was happening when this was done. 1533, just after the world is opened up by uh, the age of exploration, the discovery of the new world and so on. These ambassadors are showing the tools of their trade which make them uh, men of the world. These are men who are part of the class which is in the process of conquering the world establishing Western European rule over the world, and so on. And all of this is invoked by this uh, painting. And somebody said, what's the skull doing at the bottom? The skull, uh, that is a skull. And if you look at it from over there, you can see it much better than you can looking at it over there. That was a t trick you, you used. You see it as a skull. From, if you look at it from the side, what's it doing there? It's a memento mori, a reminder of death. And it is saying that... You, can't, you may be lords of the earth and have all these things and so on that you've accumulated, etc., and all this wealth and riches, but you can't take it with you, is, is what it's saying. In the religion of the time, it's a kind of remi reminder of that. So there's a critical element in it as well. But it is this that translates the difference between this and the trompe l'oeil painting, which was just the technical skill. This is a technical skill with all the other qualities involved, but it also is profoundly grasping a change in social reality. Go quickly. I said how you look at the sky or the uh, nature. John Constable's Hay Wayne, right, actually extremely technically skillful uh, to, to be able to, but not the main thing. Why is this painting so f loved by the English bourgeoisie, right, and on the, on, on the uh, chocolate boxes and all, 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 all that sort of thing? Because actually it evokes a mythical harmonious society, a harmonious set of social relations, uh, uh, which it was projected backwards into the English countryside and so on. Done, actually, at the height of the Industrial Revolution, 1821. But it, it, is, it serves as this mystical thing. But it's what it says about social relations, even if what it's saying about social relations could be considered a lie, but it's what it says about social relations that makes it uh, uh, important. Now... Damien Hurst, mother and child uh, divided. Um, we have uh, cut up cows, right? What does this say? When people say these things, a lot of the debate that they get into is, is it art because it's a cut up cow? And could I do that? And all this sort of thing. Okay, I, I, people can have that debate if they want to here. But I just ask you, what's this saying about social relations? It's actually about how human beings in late in modern capitalism, relate to animals and how they cut them up in a, on a kind of industrial basis. That's actually what it's saying about social relations. And look at this. The caves of Lascaux, are nearly close to the oldest art that we've ever seen, 20,000 or more years ago, and Rembrandt's The Slaughtered Ox, 1655, round the beginnings of capitalism. Notice, they're actually all dealing with the same subject. They're all dealing with beef, meat, meat that we eat, right? And this evokes the relationship between human beings and 
the meat they ate or the, the animals they hunted in a primitive communist society. This evokes it at the beginnings of cap. This is, this is commodified meat hanging in a butcher's cellar, right? And Rembrandt depicts it as kind of the martyrdom of the ox, right? Like a crucified Christ and so on. And this is the industrial modern processing of the, uh, uh, of the whole thing. When you look at it in terms of the social relations that these works e e evoke, it starts to make, make sense. Okay, two couple of pictures of Christ. <laughs> yeah, you've done your, you've done your job. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask people to. I know I'm talking too long, but I'm going to ask people to bear with me to get to the end of my slides. I'll be as quick as I can. Sorry. <laughs> um, Piero della Francesca, a baptism of Christ, right from the late Middle Ages, Florence. Grunwald, Matthias Grunwald, crucifixion. 1515, Germany. Right, two images of Christ, very, very different. This, again, you can see it in the National Gallery, harmonious form, perfect, perfect kind of stillness evoked by this, this moment, trickling down and so on, uh, uh, etc. This, all personal feeling, passion, emotion, and emotional power and so on. Okay. Why so different? Actually, because they express their real different historical moments, right? Quite close to one another, to historical time, but fundamentally different set of social relations. This painting is a product of a feudal society with, in which the church is dominant. And interestingly, um, Piero della Francesca was quite a, a scientist. He was a uh, into geometry and the, the uh, perfect form, the stillness is evoked by the fact that there's all these complex geometrical patterns uh, <laughs> involved in it. If I had more time, I'd go, go through of them and some of them. But it's a moment in time when even mathematics and science is subordinated to the overarching religious ideology. Uh, of Catholicism or Christianity, and this no notion of uh, a kind of perfect harmonious form. This, however, is painted within in two years of Martin Luther, pub, you know, nailing his theses of the Protestant Reformation uh, to the church uh, walls. This is this is a Protestant view of, uh, of Christ, and Protestantism was a critique of Catholicism, which was associated with the feudal system and the Catholic Church and its hierarchy, which were linked to the feudal lords, and this asserts a personal relationship to Christ. Right? This also expresses itself, for example, in translating Luther, translating the Bible into the Vulgate, the, pop, the language of the people, the Bible and into German and so on. And the whole notions that arise with the rise of the bourgeoisie of I think, therefore I am. And it's your personal relation with God, not what the priest says and so on. I have to summarize. But these two different worldviews and these two different emerging social relations, this reflecting the rise of capitalism of the bourgeoisie in its earliest phase within the feudal su uh, structure that gives to these two paintings their power. Right. Okay. Um, very quickly, it's a real pity, I haven't got time for more time. Suraz the Bathers, going forward to the 19th century. Uh, actually, Sura had studied Piero della Francesca in his geometrical forms, and there's a mass of geometrical forms embodied in this uh, painting. Um, uh, right, the way it's divided into triangles, the way the shapes, like of the hats and the heads, echo one another, um, the way black and, the black and white contrast is evoked, the triangles of the, uh, of the banks of the same river where this is repeat one another through it. You could do, you could do the same sort of operation that you did, I did with the Piero della Francesca on, on this. But here, what, makes it, what gives this painting its power 
is that this is about evoking a new set of social relations. This was extremely controversial when it was produced because you weren't supposed to do that kind of painting with this kind of subject matter. Factories in the background and the people who worked in those factories, the workers who worked in those factories sitting by on the banks of the river during their lunch hour or whatever, uh, etc. And that contrast made, when people saw this painting first, even some of the radicals of the impression, they went, oh my God, it's awful. We don't get it. Until, the, you know, it evokes actually a new world order and the arrival on the scene of a new social class, the industrial proletariat and so on. So that's, uh, that was what... what Right, I'm going to cut. I'll, I'll miss out Andy Warhol's. Andy Warhol's very interesting artist from this point of view, if you look at all his work, but I, I'll miss that out for reasons of time. Again, Carl Andre's equivalent, eight, the bricks in the Tate, as they're called. Again, you know, most people's reaction to this is to try and say, how can bricks be a work of art? What, you know, it, there's no skill involved. I could do that. My children could do it. I'm being con, etc., etc. But just, okay, fair enough. Maybe many of you feel that way. But ask yourself a different question. An artist makes a work of art, or what he believes is a work of art, out of an arrangement of bricks. What does that say about art and social relations? Why can't you make a, a work of art out of bricks? Answer, because works of art have to be made out of marble or iron. Or they have to be made of oil paintings. Bricks are something else. Bricks are things that you make buildings out of. So that core, it sets up a debate about what is art and its relationship to production, just by doing that, uh, 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 etc. So that makes it. It's what it says about social relations and developing social relate the development of social relations in. Uh, the 1950s, the 1960s, and so on. That makes it uh, uh, it makes it interesting. And last of all, we'll start with uh, Michael. Actually, did a, uh, a series of these. Slave Awakening. This is called something. It's called the, they don't have title proper titles, so you can call it the Bearded Giant and call it whatever. But a series of unfinished, we are told, works of slaves. Uh, that are in the process of struggling to get out of the stone. I think they're among the greatest works of art in the, uh, in the history of European art. Why? First, they were a product of a specific set of social relations that developed in Michelangelo's time. You'd had the Renaissance, you'd had a reaction against this, you had an attempted bourgeois revolution in, uh, uh, or attempted democratic revolution in, in Italy that had been crushed. So Michelangelo is reacting to that uh, at, at, at some level, but it also, I think, expresses where we are all at in an epochal sense. Are we not all somehow, somewhere in the process of struggling for human freedom, but still half trapped in the rock, still held back at every stage, still trapped by alienation, exploitation and oppression and material relations and so on. And it is that, the fact that it was both a reaction and a very intense reaction to what was happening at the time, a specific historical situation, but also something that generalizes to, uh, on an epochal scale to how we all are that makes it such a great uh, work of art. So I'll stop there. I, just to summarize what I'm saying in one sentence, it is this, that all the other qualities make for good or better or great art, but what is decisive, and I think, and I say, I think this applies to Shakespeare or James Joyce or great music and so on, what it also does is it captures and expresses social relations between people and how they're developing and changing. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks very much, John. That was absolutely fascinating. And we've still got plenty of time for discussion. So um, I'm going to open, um, open up to the floor now. Um, please, if you have a simple question, don't feel you can't ask it. If you want to make a short point, please feel that you can do that, um, that you can do that as well. 
The format is that we allow a maximum of three minutes so that we can take as many people as possible and given the packed room I would imagine that there will be lots of takers. I'm going to tap the microphone at two minutes to let you know that you're two thirds of, of the way through your maximum time and ask you to stop at um, three minutes. I'm also going to call a couple of people at a, at a time just so that we can keep the discussion moving um, and I can see I've got my first taker here already so um, you come down and the guy in black if you'd like to, to follow him. Um, it, it's just be interested to know what John's uh, opinion is of the recent Ai Weiwei exhibition. Um, I'm a bit of a sucker for art exhibitions, and I've a lot of them, but that one really moved me. And in particular, the um, work he'd got of the uh, uh, earthquake that happened in China. There's a lot of state-built schools collapsed in the earthquake and thousands of children were killed in the schools. And then the Chinese state, to uh, cover up the embarrassment of it, um, campaigned against the, or suppressed the, uh, um, <coughs> the parents of the children had lost their children. And I Wei Wei went around and actually found uh, the names and numbers of the, the children that were killed in the earthquakes. But, and then he made it into an artwork by, because the, Poor quality reinforced uh, steel that was used, rebar. The rebar was taken out by locals and straightened out to, to be resold. And he bought that up and he made it into, a, into a, an artwork in the form of a sort of wave. So the rebar was on the floor, but it was in a wave like um, um, the wave you get from an earth, earthquake, seismic wave. And then around the walls, he put the names, I think, this is right, the names of all the children that were killed died in the, in the earthquake in the schools. And there are, I think, several thousand of them. And that, that really moved me. And then in the rest of the exhibition, he talks about he gets arrested and sort of spirited away for 88 days. In addition to that, he's obviously got physical courage to actually do this when the state is obviously trying to, uh, to suppress what he's doing. And that impressed me. On the other hand, another lot of modern art seems to be really about commodifying, just about making something so it can be sold. You know, and a lot of artists, um, Damon Hirst, for example, may have done um, Mother and Daughter Divided, but clearly he's a guy who's just um, running a business, isn't he? And a lot of his art, is it art or is it just a way for him to make a lot of money? And a lot of, this is a huge market in art for the super rich, because they can makes them look clever, doesn't it? That's that's really why they're buying it. Um, so I'd be interested in that, in that as well. Yeah. F first of all, thanks very much, to that, John. It was really interesting. I really just want to ask a couple of questions. Um, see, when you showed the two pictures, and one was Hawking, and the other one was. The landscape ribbons. ones? Ribbons. ribbons. Um, and you expressed an opinion about which one you thought was the better. Um, the question I want to ask is, um, remember at the beginning where you said, when I'm a bit like this, I tend to like what I like because I don't have a lot of knowledge of art. And isn't opinion about art really quite subjective? Um, and, the re and the reason I say that is, is because I know a lot of working class people who think th th that they're getting talked down to about art and that they don't have anything to say. Uh, and for example, I'll give an example of what I mean, is I actually preferred th the painting that you preferred as well, but what I liked about, about Hockney is all the colour. Mm -hmm. And so, so what I'm saying is, aren't opinions really quite subjective? And that what we should encourage people to do is to learn and talk about art. And for example, if, if people go to museums and for example, they see a painting that is very colourful and they like that, then surely that is a valid opinion. Um, the other thing I just want to ask you is, um, I read something recently, it was a quote from Herman Goring who said, 
show me culture, they'll show you a gun. Um, could you say a bit about the Nazis had particular ideas about that, didn't they? There was certain things that they completely despised. Um, I wonder if you could say a wee bit about that. Anderson from Glasgow, uh, member of SLEP. Quite sad, I don't know what I mean. Uh, um, I've, I've been looking at art all, most of my life and all the different forms and the poetry and the novels and uh, and, and the things that, that strikes me, uh, which kind of match what you'll be saying, is uh, the poetry, especially when you get Kate saying, truth is beauty, beauty is truth. And what is truth? And it has to be social. It has to be, in some way, more and more embracing of what is real, what's true, to be appreciated. And art, in some ways, has to be like that. And I like that. Um, last as a, an, an embracement of truth. And I think that, although I find that uh, people find difficulty to, to to discuss truth because there's a relative and absolute, and you get Lenin writing on is the relative truth and what so is between absolute and relative. That comes. I'm not quite sure about how that fits into art, but uh, I find that, uh, in my appreciation of art, it has to be true and embrace truth, yeah. and that has to be social. Uh, um, and I think one of the reasons why all this debate is kind of intriguing, kind of fascinating, and has got lots and lots of dimensions to it, is that if you if you take what John said and then you sort of have to bring in the question of the, the context in which a piece of art is, is made, you get, you get this idea of like different layers of interpretation. And, and one of the, uh, referring to one of the previous speakers about the part of the problem is that there, there is a kind of elite and a, and a mystique around all this sort of stuff. And there's very good reasons why people have kind of set these things up. Um, and so it makes it all very difficult. But uh, like an example of the whole idea of a context is that if you, if you showed a painting there of uh, like a, a nice, well-crafted and skillful painting of, say, a German village, and you all looked at it and you said, well, that's, that's pretty skillful, I quite like that, maybe I couldn't do that, and things. And then you look at the signature on the bottom and it says Adolf Hitler, who was a painter. Your understanding of that image, hasn't, the image hasn't changed, but your, your, what you think about it and what your understanding of it will have, will have changed. And then if I say, actually, the signature's a forgery and it's by a Bolshevik, <laughs> you're right. You're in a right mess. And what I'm saying is that is that the, the context in which the art is produced is a very um, impo important thing. And sometimes the problem with a lot of art galleries is that that context is taken out, as though somehow the art is meant to speak directly from the wall to you, and you're supposed to get it right. And I think that it's much more complicated than that. Much more interesting. Much more uh, fascinating. And just. The other little thing that I, th I think, for anybody who is interested in this sort of stuff, there's a fantastic uh, book and a play called The Pitman Painters. I don't know who's seen it. It, it was uh, shown in, in the North East a good while back. It's been around. And it, it's about a group of Pitman who became painters and learned about art. They were miners in Northumberland. And there's still an exhibition of their work up in Northumberland. And if anybody's not seen the play, uh, it's, it is fantastic because it, it starts to grapple with... Um, the whole question of class, creativity, who's, who's involved in art and who's excluded from art uh, and so on. It's well, well worth a, a look. Thank you. Um, can I take the guy next to you sitting cross-legged on the side? Please, yeah. Thanks, Wanda. Um, I want to follow on from the idea about appreciation of art being subjective. I think... That's generally true, and I think it's kind of response to the caricature of the Marxist view of art, which had a lot to do with A.H. Darnov, Stalin's culture minister, which has the, it's easy to appreciate art. We draw a list. Up the tops, maybe people like Picasso on something. Then, th then under there is the people who are a bit less committed political, a bit less good politically. And at the bottom is Hitler, irrespective of, of what he's thinking about, and that we, do, and that we judge art in terms of how committed or how political or, 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 or was the artist was. I think that's obviously, um, obviously wrong, but we still, even if we reject that, we come to this idea of the absolute, well, this is good art and this is bad art. Um, 
referring to individual works of art. And I, 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 I think that's the wrong term. I think it's right to say good art is art which provokes a reaction, art which moves me, art which provokes me to do something. But we're talking about me in a specific historic circumstances with specific ideas, with specific un understanding. And so just as John can talk about the difference between a Catholic and Protestant crucifixion picture, a uh, painter within a, 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 a few years of each other, the way in which such um, paintings are, uh, I, 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 people react to such paintings depend on the situation, the situation in, which they look at, uh, in which they look at them. How important is the Catholic worldview, the Protestant worldview? How important is it to me that I want art which, um, which unnerves me or that I want art that, um, uh, 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 that, 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 that pacifies me? That's something which is different amongst different, uh, uh, um, different historical times, but also different amongst different people in historical times. I think it's perfectly valid to say there is art which is good for me and bad for you because it provokes a reaction in me and it doesn't and it, and, 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 and it, and it doesn't pro doesn't provoke provo provoke a, re a, re a reaction um, a, re a reaction in you. Um, what was the, was the last point I was going to, go, going to make? But I can't remember what it is. I mean, perhaps I better, I better get, get, give up. There's, there's one more point which I've got to make. Thank you. Uh, it's worth remembering that all artists are potential venture capitalists. I, I've been drawing pictures here today. Theoretically, I could take my pictures and sell them, and I could sell them for X amount of money. And if I was successful for doing that a long enough time, I would be, uh, I'd be like Mick Jagger or David Bowie or something. They're singing property developers, essentially, aren't they? And, and the same with sportsmen. They have unique selling points. They have a talent and then they use, abuse, exploit their talents uh, to the point where the Olympians, they win a gold medal, we cheer them on, and then the next week they're selling shredded wheat or something. Uh, what One reason for embracing as many people from overseas as possible is that they don't have unique selling points, they have unique telling points. And if people in Britain haven't got it in them, or in us, to actually rise up and bring down capitalism, bring as many people from overseas as possible over here, because they have stories to tell. They are unique telling points. And so, in terms of solidarity, give up on your heroes from above and impress the people who are going to be here. Hello, I very much enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Uh, the point I wanted to make was... Uh, that there was, for me, something absent naturally. This is a presentation about 40 minutes long, so something was left out that, to me, is important. And it is um, related also to art as, um, you know, expressing the social relations between individuals and between classes, if you like. And that is art as commemoration. So it's statues and, and the art we see in squares and often pass by and ignore um, until maybe it's defaced or talked about in the papers. And um, there was something interesting on Radio 4 this week, and it was the opening and the finally the opening of a commemoration of the women of steel, uh, the women who during the war had been uh, forging, basically, uh, for the country and, and to win a victory uh, for this country. And um, nothing had been done to commemorate them until recently. Many of them had died since then. But it, it was a brilliant example to me of how we can reclaim art to make it ours um, and make it reflect important social historical moments and how we've contributed to them. I would like to see many more women uh, commemorated in statues in whatever form um, and remembered throughout the country. Um, I want to say a little bit about the Rubens that was mentioned earlier. Um, it's a bit of a shame because the, the slide didn't really show the depth of it. I'll tell you a secret. Um, if possible, yeah. But I think it, uh, the, the truth of the matter is there's just as much colour in the Rubens as there is in the Hockney. Um, and the beautiful thing about the, uh, uh, the 
who wins? I mean, there's, there's the, the, the person who owns the house going off the market. Down here you can't see them. There's the workers already working in the dawn, flashing out uh, birds uh, for maybe a shoot or maybe to get their eggs or whatever. There's all kinds of social interrelationships going on with inside the, uh, the, the ground of the, of the painting. If you sit in front of it long enough, I, when I first sat in front of it in the National Gallery, I was completely and utterly uh, mesmerized by the dawn coming up, by the colors, by the way that it captured uh, that essence of a dawn, of a beginning of a working day, but also a beginning of a historical period, etc. I mean, it's an extraordinary picture. In Hockney, there was no people, um, just the colors, and it was a subjective thing. Um, so that's the first point I want to make. The other thing is I think there's a certain way you can talk about uh, art as our spiritual growth. And, as, and the same with our, uh, the economic growth, and et cetera. It's dialectical. Two things, that, two things are taking place in and out all the time. I don't think you can determine art subjectively, but I don't think you can determine just objectively. You can't say this is a great work of art. But a couple of days ago, I was at the uh, V&A looking at the uh, exhibition uh, Botticelli uh, Revisited. And absolutely extraordinary. You can't explain why a Botticelli uh, portrait of a human being that you can relate to because it's your human being too. And you can see in that person the anguish, the life, the development of who it is. But it was painted 500 years ago. So it's not just that I like it. It's the fact that it exists within inside our spiritual growth, our spiritual existence. And work will do that after we've actually captured the world and understood the world and become artists ourselves, then we, will, we can then possibly uh, uh, reject all this. But at this present moment in time, this is the stuff that is part of our growth, part of our lives, part of the way that we understand ourselves as human beings, the world that we live in, and how to change it. Uh, the very, very, like, have I got one more point? Well, very, very last point, when the bricks were shown at the Tate, there was an enormous outcry. And the BB, I think it was Channel 4, did a program on it, and they brought a group of miners from a mining village to talk about, um, you know, oh, yeah, my kid can do that, what is this art and all that. Except for one of the working class guys, I'm hoping he maybe is a Pittman poet, but one of the workers, one of the, the uh, he said, I can't tell you whether I think this is art or not because I don't know the language which is... is it, it is said in, if you don't teach me the language, don't, teach, don't ask me to rubbish something. That's what you're trying to do. You're using me, a worker, to rubbish a work of art because you don't like it. Can, um, can the guy in green come up to, to speak next? Um, I don't know what I'm going to say exactly, but it just struck me that there was something missing because... It was all men, all the artists were men, and, and everybody that's speaking more or less was men. And I feel, I don't really know much about art, but I feel there's something missing. Didn't, I don't know that women made, I don't know whether they sewed things or knitted things or something. But there are things that women have made, and that seemed to be missing from this, and that's a really important part. And, and I think that's why women aren't speaking so much in this, because we kind of feel a bit out of it somehow. I don't feel that we have, know what to say exactly, because we don't see ourselves there. And I think that is something that is missing. Thanks very much. Um, thank, you, thank you very much. If anybody wants to pick up on that point, I, I will take them. Um, uh, comrade from the floor mentioned commemorative art. I'll just give two examples of, uh, of war memorials. There's a village uh, called Britain Ferry in between Neath and, uh, uh, and, and, Sw and Swansea. It was where the, uh, the trams were mended for the Neath and, uh, and, and Swansea Tram Company. And uh, during the First World War, loads of those soldiers uh, joined up together as, as, a, as, a, as a workforce, and they fought in, in the Swansea Battals, uh, Battalion. And uh, in the Marmette's Wood Campaign, 776 of them went o over the top at Men's Wood, but out of those, 654 would be killed. And it's uh, the Britain Ferry Monument. Uh, you know, worked, uh, over a hundred of them came from Britain Ferry. It's, it's a little village, and it's it's very subdued. It's a set of marble steps leading up to a Tommy with his head bowed. And I think it really su sums up the feeling of people had at, 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 at that time, and the councils reflecting where people felt. Another Mormon warrior in Swansea erected in, in the 1990s, 
and it's supposed to be a, a war memorial of people killed in the Swansea Brits, and it's a huge ak ak gun rearing up like a huge phallus ready to ejaculate death over Swansea. And I think it really sort of sums up the, uh, the feeling of, of, of the Labour Party at that time, a sort of aggressive imperialism, but a, but a sort of like, uh, the empire strikes back, you know, we may be small, we may be Britain, but we got our guns, we can, we can fire, you know, even war memorials can be set in the social and political context uh, uh, of their time. Thank you, comrade. Um, and the next, after this lady, the guy. Yeah, thanks. Um, just wanted to say something about the, the inequality in art and can, can you hear? Yeah. And the fact that art is you know, a huge business and that some paintings are worth millions of pounds. And what occurs to me is the access to art. And one of the problems with this picture for me compared to the, um, you know, what's the colourful picture? to Hockney's painting, although Hockney himself is probably in academia, is that it's, the academy is there, that, you know, the, the universities and the art schools and so on, you know, there is something in that and in your critique of that that is saying there is something, you know, there are the rules of art, and that's true in anything. If you learn music, then classical music, you've got to learn the rules and so on. But in working class art, it... it one, and this relates also to the point about women's access to art, you, who gates keep, gatekeeps into art? And the academy is one of those places, and the international sort of investment business where people put their money into paintings and antiques and so on is another aspect that keeps the prices up and keeps other people out of the art business. And one of the points, for example, writing is more my field of art, and the fact that people are now turning to self-publishing, is, that is a means of production that belongs to the people themselves, as long as they can afford to do the self-publishing. But people are beginning to change you know, their access to art. How, you know, if we're looking at you know, the politics of inequality, art is a really good example because, as you say, women perhaps do sewing or embroidery and things like that, which are not generally worth millions of pounds. You know, and there is huge inequality, and who are the gatekeepers? And certainly, I would say the academy is one of the places that tells people a sense that they don't belong, or tells them how to, how to interpret the art. And you know, we need to value and help people to feel confident in their way of responding you know, to the world. After the guy down the front, can I take the young woman in the aisle? Um, Tim Evans, Swansea SWP. Um, again, my, my thing is more poetry. Um, although there was one thing that uh, Phil's uh, contribution put me in mind, which was uh, it may not have been a great work of art, but there was the destruction by Newport Council of a... Uh, 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 a mosaic of the uh, 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 march on Newport, uh, which was an absolute case of council vandalism, actually, and the obliteration of our history, of our working class history, um, which, which, I mean, that was a side thing. In Swansea at the moment, because of the uh, Dylan Thomas connections, uh, and, but I believe everywhere, London, elsewhere, there's been an explosion of poetry in uh, pubs and uh, other places. Um, and I'm, I'm just aware in, in Swansea, there's a group called Poets on the Hill, which came out of an th uh, intervention by Benjamin Zephaniah. And um, they are basically um, writing for the first time, a lot of them, uh, for the first time, they're writing poetry, and they're going and speaking it uh, in, in, in uh, ver various places. But there is very much a sense of a class division, actually, in the poetry scene in the town. Because on the one hand, you've got an established, an establishment of poets, if you like. And on the other hand, you've got a lot of very, very often sort of younger people or working class people who are coming up and the way that they express their poetry is not on the page so much, 
but actually spoken, sometimes something I can't bloody do, memorize, where you actually go up and put that forward. And so it's very interesting, I felt, that at the moment there, there is, a, I think, a very clear uh, class division between two different ways of doing poetry, two different ways of expressing yourself, one which is, uh, 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 w which people can grasp and another which is a lot less uh, uh, accessible to ordinary people. So I, I just wondered how that fitted in. Thanks very much. Um, I'm, I'm afraid that um, although we've managed to actually fit quite a lot of people in, this will be the last contribution. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to talk about like what what makes great art because my um, close friend who is at uh, university uh, did an art art show about um, about white women's sexuality and how kind of women are viewed and she used her naked female form to use her art and she um, actually used like fake blood to represent menstrual blood and would use um, kind of slurs that women um, have been called over time and kind of dip it in the blood and kind of put it on her body and kind of really use that kind of strong kind of imagery and then within the um the university like within um you know like people who were on a course and people that were teaching her kind of reacted against that and reacted kind of saying you know is this really art you know you can't really do this and all that kind of thing so it's kind of for me very interesting to hear you know what what makes great art because I don't think they were criticizing her art at all I think they were criticizing the fact that she'd kind of been strong enough to stand up and say, actually, as a woman, outside everywhere, I'm, I'm sexualized on the street, I'm sexualized on TV, I'm sexualized in the media, and the whole time, this, you know, this is the one time where you know, my, I can use my art to kind of really fight against that, and I, um, it's art that can be accessible, you know, it's not art that's on sort of galleries and stuff, it's art that, that I'm gonna go around and show kind of films and stuff, and, and people can really access it. So I think, yeah, it's talking, about, talking about women's art, you know, I think it's really important that art is accessible and is reactionary. And actually, so when people say, oh, that isn't art or whatever, it's actually normally, in my experience, that people have kind of reacted against what the subject matter is less than actually what the art is itself. Um, th thanks, everybody, for, um, for a great and, and very wide-ranging um, discussion. Just before... I bring John back to answer some of that. Um, I just want to make a, a couple of announcements. Um, people may have seen me waving Ways of Seeing by John Berger, which I think was the first sociology book I ever read. Um, highly, highly recommend it. Um, Leon Trotsky's Art and Revolution, a book that will be known to, to many of you, but um, if, it, if, you, if it's not on your shelf, um, there's one at the book. Bookmark stall, have we got a book? Yes, bookmark stall at the back, um, as is Marxism and the History of Art from William Morris to the New Left, uh, a collection edited by Andrew um, Hemingway. So um, they're, they're all available and many more at the bookstall at the back and, of course, in the full bookshop, which is, uh, which is just next to the bar. Um, so thank you very much, John, if you could uh, sum up for us. That'd be great. Um, but it was actually a very wide-ranging discussion and very difficult to respond to all the points in however long a time. But I want, to, I want to respond to some of the specific ones and then I want to talk about what I think was kind of the general problem that a lot of people were grappling with in, in, in one way or another. First of all, some specifics. Um, the comrade asked at the beginning what I thought of the Ai Weiwei uh, uh, exhibition and I, unfortunately I live in Ireland and I didn't see it, it didn't come to Ireland. I would certainly have gone to see it if it came to Ireland, but I didn't. So I don't have a specific opinion about that, but you gave a powerful description of it and it sounded very interesting. And what you were saying about it made me think of some other works because, and this relates to uh, the comrade who said, talked about artist commemoration. And it, they, this is one of the, because that was a commemoration in a way of their earthquake and it, its victims. And it, this is one of the important functions of art. I would argue that all the kind of things I talked about as criteria, make, whether it's good or not good commemoration, because there's bad commemorative art, you can see that in almost any city square, bad commemorative art, and sometimes you see great commemorative art. But uh, so, so 
but that is a, a, an important element, and it made me think of various things. Um, uh, it made me think of, uh, for example, the very, very famous and, uh, painting, The Raft of the Medusa, which commemorates uh, uh, the people who died in a, uh, or not the people actually who survived, uh, uh, a shipwreck, which was to do with a ship that was put to sea in an unsafe condition. Uh, the Medusa, the sort of people, the older people may remember the Herald of Free Enterprise, the sort of Herald of Free Enterprise of its day of people whose lives. So that's why Jericho, great work of uh, commemoration and important political intervention. I also found myself thinking and to the Welsh comrades, uh, a Welsh artist who um, exhibited here a few years ago, David Garner, who did an extremely moving piece commemorating um, the children who died uh, in Aberfan. For, uh, for example, when, when uh, the, uh, May, I don't know if everybody recalls that a long time ago, was it 1963? Uh, Aberfan, when children died through the, um, you know, this, the, what would you call it, the pit slag, yeah, uh, descending on their village and so on. It was a very, very powerful, just, it was done with little chairs in a school room. A is for Aberfan, so very powerful. So all, all, all of that, I think, it is. Uh, um, uh, 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 were I I important points. Um, the uh, oh, there were a couple of other things. Sorry. Um, no, I'm missing. Uh, missing. I'll, to, I'll come to uh, more the, the general problem. No. Uh, no, no, I have forgotten that. <laughs> right. What I the 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 general problem I is this. Right. That art. If you look at art in class society and in male-dominated class society, and all class society has been male-dominated, uh, it is, of course, profoundly affected by that. Right? And in fact, of the various art forms, if you compare it with poetry, for example, or music, it is the most uh, class-written, class-dominated, most elite form, art form, for very good reasons or bad reasons, however you want to, to put it, for, any, uh, for real material reasons. You can, to write a poem, you need a notebook and a pencil. Right? You, to produce music, okay, you need a musical instrument, but you can do it, and music is very close to the lives of, uh, 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 of people, uh, and so on, and all sorts of people form their bands, etc., etc. Right, now you want to make art. Where are you going to show it? Where are you going to put it? Right, all of that, it becomes a material object that becomes, has to be bought and sold. Right, and right the way you, through the history of art, it is controlled by, overwhelmingly, by the ruling classes. The people who can... Uh, sponsor it, patronize it, control the walls, control the galleries, can, uh, 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 and so on. And individual works of art, and in capitalism, mm -hmm. and capitalism doesn't begin in the 20th century, capitalism begins back in the 15th and 16th century, individual works of art become commodities that are bought and sold. Uh, and, and sold, and bought and sold uh, by uh, the, 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 the millionaires and, uh, uh, or the billionaires. I mean, I loved uh, um, Roger Huddle's description of Hetstein by Rubens. Right? Absolutely right. But I have to tell you, um, because he, he's not Damien Hurst and in our faces, people may not realize, Rubens was a multi-millionaire in his day and spent most of his life, I did a talk on this last year, painting pictures of aristocrats for the aristocracy. And he was a counter-revolutionary. Right? And I showed, it when I did that talk, and I said, yeah, but does that mean everything Rubens did was bad? No, look at Hetstein, and Roger does this beautiful, big, big white, much better than I had time to do, why it's a, a great painting. You see, there's a contradiction there. From the fact that art uh, is so dominated by the, the ruling classes. We could just say, right, well, we reject it all. Right? There have been Marxists and radicals who have taken that line. All right? But this was not the line or the view of Marx or notably Trotsky, who 
wrote extensively on, on this and so on. They argued that actually what we have to do is try and rescue from this hi history the best of art for, for the working class, not just reject it. If we want to end the elitist nature of art, you have to change the society. Because the truth is that if you live in a society where bread, the basic necessity of life is a commodity, then so will art be. Now, I, I want to say this basically, that's not the end of the, uh, uh, the story at all. One of the things that you find in, the, 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 in, in art uh, history, is particularly in the modern era, is artists have been continually trying to, as it were, critique the commodity nature of art. Right? But then, so long as capitalism survives, that then turn, turns against them and works against them. It doesn't really work out. It's a problem. Yeah, okay. Uh, for, for, for example, people will know of, of Banksy, right? Graffiti, can't commodify graffiti, can you? Oh, yes, you can. Unfortunately, you can. You know, Richard Long was an artist. He was going to, he was going to do walks in nature and use pure nature. You can't commodify that. Oh, yes, you can. You can take a photograph of your walk or whatever it is, and you can sign it, and artists need to earn a living, and Banksy becomes quite rich, and so on. This is a long and, and repetitive story. We can, of course, throw up our hands in horror and say, right, we, we don't want to know about this, but I think we, we're, the, the fact is that we actually need and benefit from art in various ways. So I, I think that in, that becomes another reason for trying to change the society. Now, everything I said uh, uh, about um, uh, it being dominated by uh, the ruling classes and so on, of course, then applies to it being male-dominated. And the history of European art in particular is extremely male-dominated. But that has changed in recent times of it. It wasn't true that I showed all men. I showed Frida Kahlo's uh, uh, broken, broken column. But if you take the history of the last 5,000 years or the last 1,000 years, 100 years, it's going to be mainly male dominated, whatever you do. There are, you can do specialist things, or, or so, but in modern, recent times, that is, that, uh, that is not so. But if we. I was going to show, it was a plan later, I was going to show the, the uh, Henry Moore family group and talk about the social relations. This depicts the traditional family as natural as it happens. One of the reasons why Henry Moore became so beloved by uh, the bourgeoisie, because it naturalizes uh, existing uh, relations. But then people who know me will not be surprised <laughs> that uh, it appears Tracy Emmons, my bed, again, controversial. Uh, a woman from sort of lower middle class, working class background, certainly people not from the academy and not fro fro from and so producers. So. Question, everybody, again, focuses on, is, could an unmade bed be art, blah, 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 blah. But what does it say about social relations? What does it say about relations between men and women? What does it say about people's lives? And actually, it says all sorts of things, like the last woman who spoke, like the, she described the work of her friend, like they were trying to do. So it's a rebellious piece of work. It's a piece of work that challenges many sorts of stereotype ways of uh, seeing women and their position uh, uh, inside. By saying that, my bed with all the detritus around it and the condoms and the booze and so on could be a work of art. By doing all that, it, it challenges. It does a lot of other things as well. But then look what happens with Tracy Emin. Tracy Emin is a rebel. The establishment embraces her. She, she was, she'd actually, Tracy Emin back in the day had quite good politics. I think she would sort of Ken Livingston, left-wing Labour supporter. She gets embraced by the, her work is commodified, she gets rich, she becomes a Tory, and so on. This is a familiar story. Does it mean, therefore, that we say, oh, it was rubbish all along? No, I think it was actually a good uh, uh, work of art. So we don't have, uh, I, I think, a simple uh, solution to these. We have to grapple with these problems, and we always will, so long as we live in capitalism and a class-divided society and so on. I also want to talk about the, the question of the subjectivity of this. This is a, there is a difficult problem here. Look, every individual has an absolute right to like or not like whatever they like. That's fine. At that level, uh, I think Chomsky once said, in the area of art, we are anarchists in the area of art. You can, you know, one of the great things, you don't do anybody any harm if you like the Hockley better than the Rubens. You're fine. 
you can't, actually nobody in this room can afford to buy either of them, but at least, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a, but you can look at them and you can like them. If you want to buy a copy of the Hockney and put that on your wall, nobody is going to stop you. Well, I hope they're not going to try and stop you. That's fine. But there is, what, what's that say? That's a stop. <laughs> I got two minutes by my watch. <laughs> so I continue. In, in, uh, okay, right. Uh, that's fine. And everybody has a, uh, but there is, I repeat, a social process by which judgments are, are formed, including our judgments. That's not attacking any individual. That's not saying that experts have the right to tell you. Absolutely not. I do not think that the uh, director of the Tate Modern can tell you what you should like. So, no, no, you work through it, you make up your own mind. But there is a social process, and the debate and the discussion that takes place in this meeting is one tiny bit of that. But that is going on uh, 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 all, all through. Now, just to finish, I was going to, I had a plan to talk about how Rembrandt's Night Watch was a powerful commentary on the social relations of its day, but I'll skip that. <laughs> right, yeah, I'll finish with this. Right. Um, back to Pope Innocent the Tenth. Right, I, sp I spoke about this and how this is actually when you paint someone's portrait, right? You're actually you're not just painting them; you're painting the relationship between the society and that person, between you as an artist and that person, and that person and the people who are going to see the the painting. It's a complex depiction of a social uh, relationship. Okay, same subject matter. Francis Bacon, screaming Pope. Uh, Sorry. Early capitalism. Right? Ruthless, brutal, adventurous, etc., etc. Late capitalism. Right? S the Pope is now screaming. Why is the Pope screaming? What is he screaming at? You don't have to say it, but think about it. This is after Nag Hiroshima and Nagasaki, after Auschwitz after the Holocaust and so on, in the extremes of alienation and so on. That's what uh, is happening. So you see, you see what I mean about how great art expresses the social relations, both positive and negative, both progressive and reactionary. And does so, regardless, it's not a question of the, the artist's point of view, not a question of what their politics are. Uh, right. Francis Bacon was a reactionary, actually. He would certainly have been a Tory voter if he'd voted at all. He had horrible opinions, as it happens. Uh, sorry uh, about that. But he gave powerful expression to human alienation in modern capitalist society, and that's why it's valuable as a work of art. Okay.